Do you have a sense of how bad China's credit losses could get? Because I've heard one estimate of up to 42 percent of GDP uh, from 31 percent last year, not just in real estate, but across other sectors, too, like technology, for instance. Well, we, we saw this once before. When China entered the WTO in 2001, they had to clean up their banking system. Now, back then, the debts were mostly to state-owned enterprises. But when all was said and done, about 40 percent of the loans were bad. Now, it, that number would be horrific if it, because China is so much more leveraged today than it was back then. Um, I don't know. We don't have a number on what we think losses as a percent of GDP would be, but, but certainly that's in the ballpark, the numbers you quoted. Um, in fact, if anything, that might be a little bit low. So it, it's a bad problem. And, and it's, it's the real problem with the economic model, Scarlett, in that if you never write off the bad investments, right, your GDP is inflated. Um, because you're borrowing money to put up, you know, another airport or another high-speed rail link that's uneconomic, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and that resides ultimately in the banking system with the debt related to that, and so that's the inherent problem with the investment-driven uh, economic model. And sooner or later, the diminishing returns on these investments begins to make a difference. Do you think other people, though, have woken up to that? I mean, we're still talking about a nation that still has a lot of foreign direct investment despite some of the challenges as of late. Well, I think people have figured out the risks. Mm -hmm. well, when we turned bearish on China back in early 2010, I think the New York Times ran not one but two op-eds uh, ridiculing the, the call. Um, and, and so, you know, it was just after the Beijing Olympics and yeah. China was, was yeah. unstoppable. Yeah. And I think now people realize it, it's a little bit more accepted that, that this investment-driven model has real risks. Mm -hmm. um, so, look, I mean, China, we get tarred with the brush that, that we think China's going to be in smoking ruins, and mm. it's not. No. It's going to have to downshift its economic growth, and it's going to have to make a transition from this model right. to a more traditional model if it's going to keep growing or a, at a reasonable rate. And that's why we think the speed bumps that will occur when they try to yeah. shift to a consumption or service-driven model right. will be more severe than people it think. It doesn't seem like much of a shift just yet, but I am curious, with regards to invest, Western investors maybe dialing it back just a little bit here, is that because of the economic model? Is that because of the economic decisions, or is it more tied to some of the political decisions and social decisions? I think it's two things. I think you've hit it uh, right on the head with the political risk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and tied in with that is governance risk mm -hmm. because Western investors have rediscovered the risks of the so-called VIE structure, mm -hmm. which is the structure that Western investors have to use to invest in Chinese entities mm -hmm. because direct investment is basically prohibited. So we have this situation where if you buy stock in Alibaba or JD.com mm -hmm. on the New York Stock Exchange, you're buying shares in a parent company sitting right. in the Caribbean, yeah. which has an economic agreement with the underlying businesses in the People's Republic. Mm -hmm. And if anything goes wrong, you have very little recourse to the assets inside the People's Republic.